Oh, uh, wait, you're listening. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. <coughs> you're listening, you're listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. See? Yep. Could I ask when this might air? Yeah. I'm four months pregnant today. And I just got a call. Yeah, no, it's super exciting. And I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's um, oh. <laughs> uh, six months ago. So it was just like... Wait, is, is Hashimoto's an autoimmune disorder? It is. Huh. I'm Molly Webster. And I'm Lulu Miller. This is Radiolab. And today we are looking into one of the biggest medical mysteries which is why a body sometimes turns on itself. Hmm. And Malls, you're going to lead us through this one? Yeah. Um, and it's something I got pulled into when I first was working on gonads. Gonads! Gonads! gonads. For anyone who hasn't listened, is the romp through sex freaking Ed? <laughs> you didn't know. You didn't know. What was the actual tagline? The parts of us that make more of us. The parts of us that make more of us. That's good. So gonads was all about like sex development, right? right? So I was like deep in X's and Y's and when do we kind of divide off on these paths that are called, you know, gender in like the top level world. Mm. And while I was in that space, one of the things that came up was that there are sex differences in how we get diseases. Okay. And one of the places this is like very apparent is in autoimmune disorders. It's very puzzling. Why does um, autoimmune disease occur eight times more often in women than men? Is it that big of a difference? For uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it is. Yeah. Wow. And of course, in MS, it's, it's two-thirds to three-fourths. Hashimoto's disease, um, 95% are women. That's like almost the entire case study. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Wow. So I just, I fell into this like series of conversations with, interestingly, like very provocative women, scientists who are like trying to answer this. Um, and we're going to circle back to each of them. But first, a little basics uh, in autoimmune disorders, your immune system, it starts attacking you. And there's like various ways it can do that. It can be anything from you have r skin rashes to patchy skin to infertility to you have neurodegenerative like MS. It like breaks down your brain and your nerves. So you end up having trouble walking and cognition. Some of them you die earlier from. Some of them, you know, are just like an itchy patch on your skin. Mm -hmm. So it really is the gamut. Uh, and and honestly, on top of all this, it seems like incidences of autoimmune disorders are going up. And so you have this real question of like, why? Yeah. Like, what's happening here? So this has to be this has to be genetics. This has to be the genetics. And so, Lulu Miller, we are going on a journey. OK. Go to the bathroom now. We have three <laughs> stops to get through. Starting with Montserrat Anguera, an immunologist. And I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. And her way into this mess is by looking at one of the most well-known chromosomes. I'm absolutely fascinated by the X chromosome. I love this chromosome. And <laughs> that sounds so silly, doesn't it? No. <laughs> and while we all know this chromosome for sex, Montserrat knows it for this other thing. The X chromosome has the highest density of immune-related genes of all the chromosomes. Oh my gosh. And so now this is interesting because everyone on the planet has one X, but typical females have two. And so Montserrat wondered, like, could there be something going on with this extra X packed with all of these immunity genes that's leading females to get autoimmune disorders more? Exactly. Exactly. Now, traditional wisdom is that if you have a second X or a third or a fourth, it will get turned off or something called silenced. 50% of the cells are going to silence mom's ex. The other 50% are going to silence dad's ex. And the way it does this is actually a really physical process because wrapped around any extra X are these long strands of RNA. We can look using a microscope 
at the nucleus of a cell, and we can um, use probes that are specific for the long non-coding RNA, and we can light them up in pink. And what we see is that RNA will form this beautiful cotton candy cloud structure huh. that completely envelops the inactive X chromosome. Wow, so it's like muzzled. Yeah, it's like, it's like uh, yeah, swaddled. Wow. It's absolutely beautiful. Beautiful and scientists assumed durable. The thought was is that once an X was silenced, and this starts in an embryo, it would stay silent. Absolutely. And not just that. Experiments have shown that in cells where this doesn't happen, the cell will just start to, like, die. So Montserrat was like, okay, I'm just going to take a look at this extra X and see lupus. what's going on. So in lupus, 85% of um, patients are women. And so she looked inside uh, cells, immune cells of people with lupus. And what she saw, no cotton candy cloud. Huh. Instead of being the fluffy cotton candy on the inactive X chromosome, they had dispersed patterns of RNA. When she looked inside, she saw little pinpoints of hot pink all over the nucleus. Whoa. So it's not muzzling. It's like shredded, evaporated. It's like, it's just all around. Right. Okay. And so it's like, what does this mean? Um, what Montserrat is thinking is that maybe this X being unsilenced is allowing um, extra immune genes to turn on, which is throwing the immune system into like this turbocharge, and that could be contributing to autoimmune disorders. Wow. <laughs> so she's saying more X is able to unsilence means more genes firing off? Yeah. Huh. Obviously, there's a ton more research to do, and this is just a working hypothesis. But um, there's, there's, one, there's one more piece to this, which is that um, as she was seeing these exes become unsilenced, she was just like, huh, you know what? I'm going to poke around in the cells of healthy folks, too, in like their immune cells. And she found that in those cells also, exes can sometimes get unsilenced. Huh. So is that like a pre-warning sign that they might be about to get sick? Um, not necessarily because like 30,000 things contribute to autoimmune disorders, um, but it might account for this other pretty rad sex difference you see in humans. Okay. Which is that if you just look at like stereotypical females and males um, who are healthy, on the baseline, females have stronger immune systems than males. Okay, so you are sitting next to Soren. You're like, you're on guard. You're ready to fight. I mean, does that then, does that reflect in those disparities? Like, do men have more, like, think, like, I don't know, viruses? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this is why the COVID numbers are so skewed. <sighs> Right. The guys have three uh, times greater uh, likelihood of going into the ICU and they have a greater chance of dying than women. Is that why? I mean, it, it's not like lifestyle. Part of it really may be a part of the puzzle. Part might... of the puzzle of why is just that like women have stronger immune systems that do stronger initial responses and so can often fight back viruses or bacteria better. Do people know this? Like, is this no? That's so I, that's so cool. Like, women just run know, around with better immune systems yeah. all the time. On any given day, a female walking around on the street is ready to fight off a of pathogen in a way that, like, men aren't. <laughs> it's just, I'm picturing, like, yeah. spears, like, phew, phew, phew. Like, we just got this whole army that men are like, Ugh, like, their, their, their warriors are, like, yeah. filing their toenails and, like. Yeah. And you're like, this is such a crazy, cool yeah. superpower. And then... And then and then I have this like one moment where I'm like, I will get less flu, but I may get rheumatoid right. arthritis. Like so there's like this. Right. There's always that whole evolution trade off thing. You can't just get a gift. It seems that, that is true. It is very hard to be excited about the superpower if you are worried about the back end of it. I'm just going to think about my little toxic exes inside of me. <laughs> They're little ticking time bombs. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I'm giggling. So. That just is not what I expected. <laughs> it struck me as funny. Okay. Yeah. When Radiolab comes back, we are going to learn how the heck we got here and a possible way out. Hey. 
My name is Jazz Adam, and I'm calling from Los Angeles. Radiolab is supported in part by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. More information about Sloan at www.sloan.org. Science reporting on Radiolab is supported in part by Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. Hey, this is Jad. Radio Lab is supported by Capital One Auto Navigator. Ready for a new ride but not sure where to start? Meet the tool that makes car shopping and financing easier. With Capital One Auto Navigator, you can find a car and get pre-qualified instantly. You'll get your real rate and monthly payment without even impacting your credit score. It's so simple, you might feel like you're taking the easy way out. That's because you are. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Terms and conditions apply. Find out more at CapitalOne.com slash Autonavigator. Hey, this is Jad. Radio Lab is brought to you by the John Templeton Foundation, harnessing the power of the sciences to explore the deepest and most perplexing questions facing humankind. Learn about the latest discoveries in the study of hope and optimism, intellectual humility, and free will at Templeton.org. Whether you're debuting a new Gonads podcast series or launching a new startup, making big announcements can be daunting. When the stakes are high and attention spans are low, your messaging has to be as powerful and eye-catching as possible. Radiolab is supported by Squarespace, and they're here to help. Squarespace is the one-stop shop for your domain, website, and marketing tool needs. They offer beautiful templates created by world-class designers, and everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box. Go to squarespace.com slash radiolab for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer code radiolab to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Molly? Yes, Lulu. Hi. Hi, this is Radiolab. We are back (laughs) from a quick break. Today, we are talking about, what are we talking about, Webster? We are talking about why it is beautiful and terrible to be a person with two or more X chromosomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Because on one hand, like, maybe you're a little bit better at fighting off viruses, but that same immune system can also turn on you. So I do think sometimes this just happens. There's accidents. There's imperfect innovations in evolution. But is there Mm -hmm. any sense of, like... Why this might be advantageous, why this might be the case that we are the unfortunately or fortunately chosen ones. Yeah, there's probably a few different ways into why, but I talked to one scientist who gave a really, uh, I don't know, almost like haunting, beautiful why. Haunting and beautiful. All right. Let's just circle all the way back. And that's our second scientist. Melissa Wilson. She's a geneticist and professor at Arizona State University. And Melissa is taking us all the way back to about 100 million years ago to when the placenta evolved. Mm -hmm. Mm. And so, as you'll remember from our last Recently met and got to know intimately. We did. So I won't go deep into it here. Y'all should go listen. It's called Everybody's Got One. But what you need to know here, the placenta is not the DNA of the pregnant individual. It's like a foreign object. And so your body naturally wants to fight off something that's not part of it. But the placenta was pretty wily and it started doing things to essentially get the mother's body to let it stay Mm. and to not Mm. attack it. Right. And so... One of the things the placenta does is it quiets the mom's immune system. Mm. The placenta itself is blubbing off signals to downregulate the pregnant person's immune system. And it's like just shushed. So the pregnant person's immune system has to say, okay, sure. You know what? We're going to downregulate components of that. That's fine. But you know what? If I downregulate everything, I don't have sanitation. I don't have antibiotics. This is over most of evolutionary history. If I downregulate everything, dead, I will die, right? And so the the pregnant person's body has to do this kind of tightrope walk. It has to take those signals from the placenta to downregulate components of it, but it also needs to to say, "You know what? No, I can't downregulate everything. I have to upregulate some things to be able to not die of parasites and pathogens." So Melissa's hypothesis is like, while 
we were all co-evolving, right? Like the 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 human the human mammal um, and our ancestors were starting to get a placenta, and the placenta and the fetus and the human ancestor mammals were all trying to figure out how to live with each other in this big dance. One of the things that happened was if the placenta is going to drag down the immune yes. system to right. shush it, then the <gasps> mom is going to start evolving an immune <gasps> system that's actually be stronger. Overexpressed? Yes, yes. So that when it's dragged down, it's not dragged down to like a death level. It's just dragged down to like a moderate level. Oh. Right, yay! Wow. Wow. Okay. So essentially, it's all the placenta's fault. Like, we double X's have to walk around with these amped up immune systems to just survive its presence. Theoretically, yes. Um, And you actually might be able to see this play out really today. Because in some women who have autoimmune disorders, their symptoms will go away during pregnancy. They have, like, they have symptoms and then it just goes away. People with rheumatoid arthritis who become pregnant, it's as if th- their autoimmune disease is gone. This also happens with MS, multiple sclerosis. What, what does go away mean? Like, like if I, we could talk specifically about mm-hmm. MS or rheumatoid arthritis or both. Mm-hmm. The inflammation that people have in rheumatoid arthritis around their joints, um, around their spine, it literally disappears. For a subset of people, for a large subset of people, it's as if it is the best possible treatment. In rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you know, for 75% of people, symptoms will go away. And in multiple sclerosis, it's like an 80% reduction in flare-ups. I mean... And not even just a reduction in the symptoms, but in some cases, you actually get cognitive ability back. No, no way. It's huge. And so I had just, you know, these experts all telling me that, like, they have these anecdotal stories of women who just want to be pregnant all the time because they get such relief in their symptoms or such a slowing of disease progression. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it is not a slam dunk for every individual or even every autoimmune disorder. Some of them actually get worse when you're pregnant. Some stay the same. Some we just have no data on and we don't know. But it does make you wonder. The 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 first OBGYN that I met with. You'll remember Melissa at the top of the episode told us that she's pregnant and that she recently developed Hashimoto's. He, he said, oh, my colleague was just telling me about this paper they read about pregnancy and how it shaped the immune function. I was like, that's me! <laughs> and now that she's sort of like stepped into her own research in this pretty novel way, um, she's actually quite curious to see if pregnancy alleviates her own autoimmune symptoms. And so I'm actually going to be going, hopefully, to get testing in the next few months to see if the antibodies that my um, body is making to my thyroid have have actually changed during the pregnancy. Okay, so there is one more part to her hypothesis, and it could offer an explanation for not only why females get autoimmune disorders more than males, but why the incidence might be going up. So for nearly all of human history, uh, we didn't have contraception, and you could be pregnant uh, for your entire reproductive career. We now live in a world where, at least in Western or industrialized nations, people are getting pregnant way less. Mm -hmm. So we're not going through the cycle of having our immune system dragged down. Mm -hmm. So if it's on high all the time, maybe that in and of itself, the less pregnancies, is actually contributing to why um, women today are getting autoimmune disorders more than in the past. It's like there's just more time that you're spent turbocharged. There's more time spent at 10. And then your body is just like, I'm constantly at a 10. Yeah. Maybe I should go do something. And so we think it's like, I've got nothing to do. Let me just start eating this body. Wreaking havoc. Hmm. There's this weird thing where I'm like, oh, crap. I should get pregnant. 
<laughs> like, like it's like, it's like, oh, and it's funny because one of my colleagues was like, you know, there's already so much societal pressure on women to, mm. you know, follow, to conform. And now, like, really, biology is telling us that because we're not getting pregnant, um, you know, we're f***ing ourselves, essentially. And so no, no, a, no. Yeah. No, keep, keep going, though. No, but uh, then the funny thing is, is then I think, like, the reverse of that is, like, you know, how many kids would be enough kids? Yes, we you know? don't know, right? We don't know yet. We don't know if it we don't know if it's more important that you start reproduction as soon as you're reproductively active or whether you maintain it over the whole course or is two enough if you have one 10 years apart or is we have zero idea. So Melissa was basically like, okay, slow your roll. First off, <laughs> there's so many things that can contribute to an autoimmune right. disorder. I don't think this is going to be your solution. Also like do you have one? Do you know you're going to get one? Like, we don't know right. anything about right. them, really. Right. Oh, science is not saying, go get pregnant. It's not. A hundred percent not. What it's saying is that pregnancy may have shaped our immune systems. So let's figure out what components of our immune systems respond to the placenta, what components of our immune systems act independently of that, and then we can narrow in on the treatments. Mm. Um, is anyone trying to study it? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. What is the factor? Which brings us to... Hi, my name is Dr. Rhonda Voskel. Our final scientist. I'm a professor of neurology at UCLA. So Rhonda's out there in California working to understand what specifically, precisely, is happening during pregnancy. And she's narrowing in on something that's being produced by the placenta at hmm. levels the body just hasn't seen before. Something happens during pregnancy whereby the fetal placental unit makes a, a kind of a novel estrogen. And this estrogen okay. is um, called estriol. And that is an estrogen called estriol. Hmm. Now, all of a sudden, you have this burst of a new estrogen, a different estrogen, and it's at a very high level. And at the end of pregnancy, your body is flooded huh. in estriol. And the baby's body is flooded in estriol. It's like a primary hormone that just skyrockets during the third trimester. Wow. And then after delivery, it drops abruptly. Well, of course, it's made by the fetal placental unit. AKA the placenta who has been manning the estriol dials has left the building. Um, and... I could probably tell you some boring things that wouldn't actually help you understand estriol more. It's just like a different shaped molecule than other estrogens. Um, it has particular functions for the fetus. Um, it could be used in neural development. It's also used by the placenta to turn down the mom's immune mm -hmm. system. And so she starts clinical trials, and she's been doing them since, like, 2007 and 2011. She takes non-pregnant women who have MS, and she gives them estriol. Trials, and we showed that it reduced these enhancing lesions by over 70%. Symptoms go away. They see disease progression slow. Whoa. The other thing that's pretty cool is, as we were doing these trials in humans, there was a, an improvement in, in, in cognition. It is neuroprotective. I basically was like, can I get yeah. some estriol? I mean, you well, know? I was Google as you've been talking. I was like, are there estriol pills? So it would be a pill, except it's not approved anywhere yet for MS. Um, in Europe, I think some people might give it off label because it's been approved for menopause. Uh, just for X. X. Just for just okay. for XX individuals okay. or X plus individuals. Um, and would this work? Could estriol work on a, a guy or an XY person? Um, that That's an interesting question. I mean, theoretically, yes, because it's a natural hormone. Rhonda says like you'd have to keep an eye out for different feminization things. Like would mm -hmm. it act on their breasts in a certain way? It works in XY mice. Real? Oh, so meaning like the the XY mice given some estriol and they yeah they saw wow. they saw a reduction in inflammation huh yeah huh yeah yeah um, but they've not done any clinical trials on XY humans okay there is a, a strong case to be made for estriol in MS women and I, and, may, and probably rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid arthritis I think there's a case to be made in psoriasis there's clearly a role for a pregnancy level of estrogen as a treatment for these autoimmune diseases in women who've already got the disease I think there's clearly a role for further investigation into that and also really quick you said at the very beginning yeah. that like this is the work of provocative women why, why did you use the word provocative? 
Because they're looking into stuff. Like when I talked to Montserrat, mm-hmm. she said that at the time she was the only scientist in the world looking at X inactivation and autoimmune disorder. Really? And do is it that's stupid. <laughs> That's like in, that's insane to me. And and Rhonda Voxel, like she, she is the studies that she's doing, like nobody else was doing. Mm. And Melissa's pregnancy compensation hypothesis it just came out two years mm. ago. So I use the word provocative because they're asking questions and doing work that like nobody else is doing. And they're actually like upending science, like like Montserrat's paper that showed that X inactivation is not constant from time of embryo onwards is like Like upending. 17 textbooks had to be like, oh, we got to scratch out this, this dogma of how it works. It's like the earth is cracking and they're the ones that caused the quake. Does that make sense? I don't know. I have no idea where this yeah. ends. <laughs> but this, it sounds like what you found is like this very substantial start. It's... It, that's yeah. the thing. That's, that's, you know, Rhonda's getting paper after paper after paper that says we're seeing estriol make a difference. And then we've got this X inactivation stuff. Then we've got this pregnancy hypothesis. And it's like, it feels like we're at the, whether we like it or not, the very beginning of a story. Um, so there really is no ending. Yet. Hey, whatever happened to um, Melissa? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you know how she asked when the story was going to air? <laughs> that was two years ago. Hi. Oh, hi, baby! And when I jumped on the phone with her recently... <laughs> that's, that's the 15-month-old, and the 3-month-old is sleeping. I found I, out I, it has been quite the two years. I have two pandemic babies, and one of them has gotten to be home with me. <laughs> 24-7 for his entire life. <laughs> well, then I'll just say, okay, so maybe you can just tell me then about the pregnancy and 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 what did end up happening. Because I feel like that was like a cliffhanger <laughs> in the interview where for months I was like, I wonder, I don't know what her symptoms are. And if she was having symptoms, like, I wonder if they went away. So any symptoms that I would have acknowledged would have been tiredness, Mm -hmm. um, some hair loss and, um, and getting cold. But then when you're, when you're pregnant, your hair does wonky things. And (laughs) so her Uh, hair did get better when she was pregnant. Great. And she did feel less tired, but, but one thing did jump out at her before she was pregnant as part of her disease, her thyroid was acting really wonky. Um, occasionally my thyroid antibodies, which is part of the way they diagnose it, they just spike up to like thousands of times larger than they should be. It's just like they give you the test and they say like, oh, the range should be, you know, single digit to double digit. And when yours is in the thousands, you're like, "Mm." Wow, that's what it was actually in the thousands. Oh, yeah. And then while she was pregnant, my thyroid and my thyroid antibodies and everything was just normal. Her numbers stopped spiking. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Did you, I remember, I remember you said to me, there are, I've talked to women who have been like, I just wish I could stay pregnant because I Mm. feel so much better. Um, Mm. That's not the reason for your back-to-back pregnancies. It wasn't like, I feel so much better. I'm going to stay pregnant. (laughs) No, no, it was, it was that we wanted a, a second baby and we're, um, and the universe saw fit that they should be so close together. Yeah. <laughs> Molly Webster. This episode was produced by Sindhu Nyanasambandam and Molly Webster. And the Gonads theme song that you heard at the top of this episode was written, performed, and produced by Majel Connery and Alex Overington. Thanks for listening. Bye. Radio Lab was created by Jad Abumrad and is edited by Soren Wheeler. Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser are our co-hosts. 
Susie Lechtenberg is our executive producer. Dylan Keefe is our director of sound design. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Jeremy Bloom, Becca Bressler, Rachel Cusick, W. Harry Fortuna, David Gable, Maria Paz Gutierrez, Sindhu Nana Sambandam, Matt Kielty, Annie McEwen, Alex Neeson, Zara Kari, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster. With help from Shima Oliai, Sarah Sandbach, and Candace Wong. Our fact checkers are Diane Kelly and Emily Krieger. Thank you.